Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the many facets of memory. Thank you so much for joining. We're really delighted to have so many people attending. Uh, before we get into the meat of the webinar today, there's just a few things to mention. Um, a little agenda first. We'll start with a brief activity. Uh, we will then move on to a slideshow given by Dr. Henry Manka, who is our CEO here at Posit Science and who is also a neuroscientist. He'll be talking about how memory works in the brain and a bunch of other stuff. Then we will switch to kind of a discussion between Dr. Michael Merzenich, who is our co-founder and chief scientific officer, and Dr. Manka on some other facets of memory. Um, we'll finish up with uh, some Q&A from the audience. If you would like to, to ask a question, you can just move your cursor to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click the Q&A um, section and type your question there. We won't get to every question today, um, but we will try to get to some of them. I think that that is about it. Oh, there's one more thing. We will be using some polls today. Occasionally you will see a poll pop up on your screen and it will just ask you a question and just click the answer that you think is best. All right, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Henry and Mike, who are your main hosts for today. All right, here I am, Mike. Let's see if we can get you on the camera too. Oh, there we are. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? I'm good. All right, I can hear you just fine. Nice to see you, even if it's just by Zoom today. Uh, hey, uh, before we get started, uh, we'll just maybe give a few more minutes for people to uh, join us as they're trickling in. I see our attendee count growing and growing here. So, uh, hey, catch me up. Last Sunday was Father's Day. How was your weekend? Uh, well, I mean, we had a classic Father's Day. We, I th I'm sure a lot of people that, you're, uh, in the, that are joining us today had the same kind of experiences. But, you know, my, my daughters, uh, Karen and Margie and their families uh, showed up at our home and we had a wonderful you know, sort of classic barbecue rib dinner with a salad and uh, with potatoes and peas from the garden, you know. And then uh, my grandkid, Kermit, cooked the most beautiful strawberry rhubarb pie. And, you know, he's sort of a wild and crazy guy and a 17 year old. So I was, that was a happy thing to see, see him come up with something so delicious. I'd actually spent most of the weekend, I was working on a table that I'd been making for my daughter, Karen. But unfortunately, she and her you know, husband, Ross, couldn't join us because they were with their in-laws in Virginia. But we had a great time. We just had a great time. That sounds, uh, that sounds fabulous. And maybe I should come join you next year around. Uh, but uh, I had a pretty nice weekend also. Uh, every year, my daughter gives me a Father's Day shirt. And uh, this year, she gave me this shirt. I don't know how well you can see it, but it has these fantastic orange tigers on it. Now, just to be clear, my daughter Ivy, is uh, she's 16 years old. So this time around, she gave me this shirt and she dared me to wear it on the webinar because she <laughs> thought maybe, maybe it wasn't really suitable like professional attire. But I took her up on the dare because that's just the kind of relationship that Ivy and I had. Uh, but it was nice. You know, the city's opening up a bit now, as you know. So we went out to dinner in our neighborhood burger joint. You know, I had burgers, I had fries, I had a cold beer. You know, what more could you ask for on Father's Day? Henry, tigers are perfect for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Margie. Yes. So we're going to take a quick little poll right now. Um, this is based on the conversation that these guys just had. It might come as a little bit of surprise, but this is just kind of a little example of how memory works. Um, which of these people joined Mike at his home to help celebrate Father's Day? Is the first question. Which foods were on the menu at his Father's Day dinner? And what kind of pie did Kermit make? Uh, so if you can just answer those questions to the best of your ability. All right, I see some responses starting to come in. Oh, people are doing well. All right, they're doing great. They're doing mm -hmm. great. All right, I, I hope everyone's enjoying this. A, a little bit of a trick and a little bit of a fun, but uh, just a great way to kick off a memory webinar to talk about what it's like to hear something. <laughs> okay, um, I'm actually going to mention something interesting about memory right now, which is that those of you who said, which of those people joined Mike at his home to help celebrate Father's Day who answered Karen? That is what Mike said. That is not true. Mike mistake his daughter's name Betsy for Karen. Karen was <laughs> actually out of town. That's, so uh, that's, that's an illustration of how memory I failed. 
<laughs> so, so those of you um, taking this poll, just know that uh, no matter who you are, that happens to us. We slip up with names. Uh, which foods were on the menu for his father, family's Father's Day dinner? Uh, the correct answers were salad and peas. So the people who said that, good job. Uh, and what kind of pie did Kermit make? Uh, most people remembered that it was strawberry rhubarb and not any of these other choices. So good job. And if you didn't get them right, that's okay too. This was just a little demonstration of something. <laughs> Super. And in fact, that last one is so interesting. The reason so many people got strawberry rhubarb pie is because it's such a notable name and that kind of thing really tends to stick with us. And uh, that's a wonderful opportunity for me to uh, kick off. And I am going to share my screen now, just a moment. And let's see if I can get this right. Hang on. And we will dive into today's discussion of how memory works. Well, super. Well, hey, thanks to everyone for joining along in our little impromptu memory check-in. It's really the uh, perfect kickoff to our webinar today about how memory works in the brain and what you can do to sharpen your memory as well. So let's start with just a look at the brain shown in this beautiful blue 3D image. And I'm just going to orient you a little bit. Maybe you're not like me. You don't look at brains all the time. Uh, so in this image, the front of the brain shown here uh, is uh, the part of your brain that's kind of right behind your eyes. And this part uh, back here is located down sort of at the nape of your neck, kind of where your neck meets your spine. Uh, and we can see the left-hand side of the brain here and a little bit of the right-hand side of the brain poking through. So I'm going to give a very quick tour of the memory centers of the brain on this slide, and then we'll dig into some details on the next slide. So when you form a memory, and for now, let's talk about uh, memory for something you hear, like a phone number, or maybe the contents of the webinar today. Um, we'll start actually in the auditory cortex, which is located in this little bump right here. That's one of the earliest parts of the brain that receives signals from the ear about what we're hearing. And we store that information very briefly in what's called sensory memory. That information is then sent to the front part of the brain here, the frontal cortex, where we store it in working memory. And then after that, it's sent on to these yellow curvy structures located deep within the brain called the hippocampus, which begins the process of storing what we hear in long-term memory. So let's go through each of those steps in detail and learn more how that works. So starting in the auditory cortex here, the home of our earliest stage of sensory memory. This is a very brief kind of memory that lasts just long enough for us to perceive a word. Now, it turns out that in order to make a memory of something that happens into the world, we have to have a strong, fast, accurate perception of the world. And if we have a weak, murky, noisy perception of the world, we won't make a strong memory. Here's an example. As I'm sure you know, it's hard to perceive speech in a noisy environment. Here's a little recording of me saying something in the quiet at first. Hi, my name is Henry. So you probably nicely heard even over the internet me introduce myself and you know my name is Henry. Um, if you were just meeting me, that'd be pretty easy to hear and pretty easy to remember my name. But let's say we met at a party and a lot of people were talking in the background. It's actually really hard to hear. Maybe my name is Henry, maybe Harry, maybe it was Arnie, really who can say? Uh, and you have this problem because your brain has the same problem. In the middle here, I'm showing the electric response of your brain to speech in the quiet, shown in black, and speech in noise, shown overlaid in red. And you see that there's very, very fast responses here as your brain is processing each part of speech. But what's important is that this response of your brain to speech and noise in red is much smaller than it is in the quiet. The brain itself has a hard time picking out the important speech from the background noise. And that shows up as problems in memory. I don't care how good your memory is, it's going to be worse in a noisy environment. Here's data from a great university-based research study where they asked people to remember a list of 10 words. And if they presented that list in the quiet, people could remember seven or eight words on the average. Pretty good. But if they presented exactly the same words in a noisy environment, people could only remember four or sometimes five. So to form a memory, we have to have strong, accurate processing in the earliest parts of our brain information processing systems. But next, our brain has to hold on to this information for a little while to make a memory. We can't just keep it in sensory memory because the next thing we hear is going to erase our sensory memory. We have to put it in working memory. Now, working memory lasts for a minute or two, and it helps your brain make associations across time, like what happened before or during or after an event that you tried to remember. It also lets you manipulate that information so you can do something useful with your brain uh, with this information and working memory. Now, the interesting thing about working memory is that your 
your brain has to have a way of sustaining activity on its own, even without any more sensory input. Think of a person telling you their phone number. As they say the phone number, each digit, each number goes into sensory memory, but then the next number comes in, which erases the sensory memory. Your working memory has to hold on to each number as a new one comes in. So how does that happen? Well, let's take an example of a phone number. Here's the Brain HQ customer support phone number. You can always call us if you have a question about Brain HQ. We'd love to hear from you. Now, what happens in your brain when I read out this number? Well, I'll do that. It's 800 514 3975. Well, after that information gets processed in sensory cortex, which helps your brain figure out which number is which, that information gets sent to the front of your brain up here, the frontal cortex for storage and working memory. Now, when that information enters your working memory, it actually kicks off an oscillation in your brain's electrical activity. It's like ringing a bell. And what's interesting about this is that there's a relatively slow oscillation, which you can see here, and happens maybe six or eight times per second. But on top of that, there's this very fast oscillation that's occurring almost 40 times per second. So we get this kind of waxing and waning of electrical activity in the brain. And it turns out that's how frontal cortex keeps things in working memory. It can sustain this ringing, just like how when you hit a bell, that ringing sound lasts for a long time after you hit the bell. And the frontal cortex can encode information in this ringing. If you look closely at the pattern, and I'll blow it up here, you can see that there's about seven or so little bumps on top of the big bump. Now, brain scientists think that each of these little bumps is an individual group of neurons that codes for one item in working memory, like a single digit of a phone number. So we got 5143975. And that's how your brain is keeping track of that phone number when you first hear it. Now, this might also explain why people on the average can keep about seven items in their working memory, which is why phone numbers have seven digits originally. There's just not that much room for more, given how your brain is encoding this information in electrical activity. But let's say you want to remember that phone number tomorrow. How can your brain store it for a long time? Well, it can't stay in working memory. You have other things to do with your working memory over the course of the day. Your brain needs to store it in long-term memory and a type of long-term memory that scientists call explicit or declarative memory, memory for facts and things that you know, like a phone number or your mom's birthday or where you live. So to do this, the frontal cortex sends this information to a part of the brain located deep underneath the surface, this yellow part here called the hippocampus. Um, that's actually, weirdly enough, that's Latin for seahorse, because early brain scientists thought that this curved shape of the hippocampus looked like the curved shape of a seahorse. Now, it turns out those slow and fast oscillations from the frontal cortex are just perfect for driving brain rewiring or brain plasticity in the hippocampus. When the cortex talks to the hippocampus in this language, the hippocampus builds new connections between neurons and eliminates old ones. Now here's a movie representation of what that looks like from a lab at the University of California, the University of Southern California that studies brain plasticity. Now you can see this neuron is getting ready to make new connections. It's sending out some growths here. These little uh, colored lights you see represent the electrical activity inside the neuron. And once it sends out those new growths, you're gonna see that these growths start to change and bubble a little bit as this neuron is looking to make new friends and make new connections. There you can see it getting ready in that way. Now in just a moment, we're gonna see another neuron is gonna grow a connection to talk to this one. It's gonna come in here from the upper left in just a moment. And here we go, you see it there in orange, it's reaching out and it's actually gonna come all the way over here and form a new connection to the neuron that we've seen already. Now these new connections are what's encoding the memory. And they also encode the context of the memory, everything that was happening around the memory as well. Who said the phone number? That guy, Henry. Where you were, probably sitting listening to a webinar. And what the phone number is for? Well, it's for calling posit science. All that gets encoded as new connections between neurons here uh, and associating all those memories. But we're not done yet. The hippocampus isn't the final storage site for long-term memory. In fact, the cortex and the hippocampus are in a dialogue here. When you're awake, the cortex encodes new memories and sends them onto the hippocampus, which rewires itself to hold onto them. But then when we're asleep, the hippocampus does something amazing. The hippocampus actually plays those memories back to the cortex, and it actually does that in hyperspeed. And in doing so, it rewires the cortex, which is where those memories are truly stored for the long term.
In this way, it's like the hippocampus is rehearsing or practicing those memories while you sleep. And as it does that, it engraves those memories on the cortex for storage. Now, this takes the place over the many nights of sleep, not just one. And if your sleep is frequently interrupted, you won't consolidate those memories in the cortex. Your memories will be weaker and less resilient. Now, that's why sleep is so important for brain health and learning. On the other hand, if you keep practicing that learning over several days, that helps your hippocampus spend your sleeping time consolidating those memories really strongly in your cortex, which helps you learn and remember even better. So you practice your Spanish, work on that saxophone you've been picking up, and train on Brain HQ regularly. That's going to help drive that change into your cortex and really rewire your brain for the better. Now, let's remember something. What happens when we've encoded a memory? Well, let's say I ask you, what's the Posit Science customer service number? What happens in your brain? Well, if you're paying careful attention when I ask the question, it kicks off a wave of associations. You learned that on the Brain HQ memory webinar. You were at home that day towards the end of the COVID crisis. We took that memory check-in and I got Mike's pie wrong. Um, it had that cool picture of the brain in blue and all those associations helps your brain then surface the memory that the number is 800-514-3975. So remembering, though, is not like looking up a recipe in a box, or it's not like looking up a photo in an album. Remembering literally recreates the brain activity in which you originally sensed the stimuli that created the memory. And in fact, that's where the word remember comes from. It's from the Latin, and it essentially means to call to mind again. Now, why do we ever forget anything? You know, this is all great. We've stored all this information nicely in our cortex. Why would it ever go away? Well, most people think the way the brain works is that it can do one of three things. It can be learning new things, it can be remembering old things, and it can be forgetting things that we've remembered. And often people think, well, why don't we just get rid of that third one? Wouldn't this all be a lot better if I just learned and remembered and I never forgot anything? Unfortunately, that's not how the brain works. The way the brain thinks it works, and the brain's in charge here, is the brain really can be doing one of two things. The brain can be changing, which means learning or forgetting, or the brain can be not changing, which means sensing something for the first time or remembering it. But there's not really a third thing the brain can do at any time. So when your brain is rewiring from learning, it also might be rewiring and forgetting things. And what's important to say is that you don't forget something because your brain runs out of room or it runs out of memory. You know, a lot of people think that the brain is like a hard disk inside your computer and eventually it fills up. And if you wanna store something new, you have to delete something old. But the brain isn't really like a computer at all. Your brain doesn't forget memories to make room for new ones. And in fact, the capacity of the brain to store memories is simply enormous. Brain scientists have no real idea, frankly, of how many memories a human brain can store, but it's a lot and no one's found a real limit yet. But if we remembered everything that happened to us automatically, like a video camera or an audio tape, that could cause problems. There are people who have what's called highly superior autobiographical memory, and they do remember almost everything that happens to them. But it's not as great as you think. Often such people report mental health problems related to depression or obsessive compulsive disorders, perhaps because they can't let go of important events or details. So it's important that we don't store everything that comes in. And in fact, our brain just helps us store the things that we're paying attention to and that are most important to us. But uh, hey, you might be saying, Henry, this all seems pretty complicated and it seems like a lot could go wrong. And, uh, and you are exactly right. Memory is pretty complicated and sometimes things do go wrong. So one way memory can go wrong is if the frontal cortex, which is the home of working memory, gets damaged. This is unfortunately more common than you might hope. Uh, in one case, a person reported in the scientific literature by their initials KF was in a severe motorcycle crash. Um, he was actually unconscious for 10 weeks after the accident. And his memory for day-to-day -day events once he came out of the hospital was normal. He remembered who he was. He knew what recent events and historical events were. And he could speak and read. He could recognize words and he could understand their meaning. But he had a main significant problem. He had an, almost a complete inability to repeat verbal stimuli. You know, if you read him a phone number like 514-3975, he could repeat that first number, five, but none of the rest of the numbers he could come up with. And what that sad story tells us as scientists is that working memory is a very specific kind of memory in the brain. And even if it's damaged, other kinds of memory, like declarative or explicit memory from life events, is okay. But what about the opposite situation? What if you have damage to that deep structure of the hippocampus? 
Well, there's a very well-known example of this, a patient who was again known by their initials this time, HM. Uh, so HM suffered from severe epilepsy and uh, the seizures it turned out were starting in his hippocampus. And so a neurosurgeon removed the hippocampus on both sides of HM's brain to cure his epilepsy. Well, that part worked. He didn't have epilepsy anymore, but it became immediately clear that he no longer was able to form new memories. His most recent memories were from a few years before his surgery. Now, his skill learning was just fine. He could learn to play a little tune, for example, and his emotional learning was intact. He could develop the sense of friendship or, frankly, the sense of fear in certain situations. But every day for HM was like the first day of waking up. Every day he woke up, it was like waking up and starting life from scratch. And, of course, he couldn't live independently. He had to live in a care facility for the rest of his life. Now, this sad story tells us that the role of the hippocampus, information has to pass through the hippocampus to become a long-term memory. That's why HM couldn't form new memories. But the hippocampus itself is not the storage site. That's why HM could still remember events from before his surgery. Now, if you've ever seen the movie 50 First Dates, you might be familiar with this. In this movie, a young woman suffers from this kind of memory problem so that every date she goes on with her boyfriend is her first, and they fall in love over and over again. Um, or for a darker take, you might have seen the movie Memento, where the protagonist has this kind of memory problem, and he has to write down and reread his notes constantly in order to remind himself who's his friend and who's his enemy and who's he's tracking for revenge. But how about sort of more mild memory problems? How about tip of the tongue syndrome, which happens? So why can't I remember this word? It's on the tip of my tongue. So for example, let's say I were to say to you, hey, what's the name for something? It's a round object. It's got a magnetic needle. It's used for finding the direction of north. Explorers and sailors navigate to their destinations. Now, you might know that word right off the bat because it's a compass. Um, but sometimes people have a little problem. It's on the tip of their tongue. They feel like I know that word, but I can't quite say it. And scientists who study this find that certain kinds of common errors are made. People will say a similar object like, oh, it's a map or it's a sextant. Well, that's not quite right. They might have similar sounds. They might say it's a, a Columbus, a rumpus. Again, not quite right, but closing in on it. People sometimes know what the starting sound is. It's cuss something, but I can't get the whole word. Or they might know the number of syllables it has. You know, it's got a bump bump, right? But I can't quite think of it. Now, this happens to just about everyone. So what's going on in our brains when this is happening? Well, one thing that can be going on in our brains is actually overactivation. You know, sometimes we just know so many words related to this idea that all those words come bubbling up and the correct word just doesn't quite win the battle to come to the front of our mind. The other thing that can be happening is underactivation. Somehow when we learned the memory, there wasn't enough context. It wasn't strong enough so that all these clues didn't drive enough of those connections to produce the word compass when we were looking for. Now, it's important to know that tip of the tongue feels pretty common. It happens in young people, middle-aged people, and older people. And if you occasionally can't think of a word, it does not mean you have Alzheimer's disease. Um, but if a person uh, that you know is having more and more of these moments, which is to say this issue is increasing over the past few years, that could indicate that something's going on and it's worth discussing with your doctor. Uh, so one thing you can do is get more context to drive more associations when you're learning things. And of course, another thing you can do is train with Brain HQ. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So how about names? Many people find it very hard to learn names, right? You meet a person at a wedding, you know that you know them, but what is their name? Your brain just draws a blank when that happens. You might know how you met them. You might remember what their job is or their friends, but not their name. So what's happening in the brain when that happens? Well, usually the problem is that there's a lack of strong associations. If you learn someone's name, let's say Mary, the problem is that person could be named virtually anything. It's completely arbitrary what their name is. And arbitrary associations are the single most difficult for a brain to learn. Much easier to learn a story about someone, their job and their friends and so forth. So uh, when you meet someone, if you're having this problem, work on forming associations with their name. Think about how you met them and, uh, and, uh, and what they're doing. And that will help form stronger associations. So why does memory decline with aging to bring all these threads together? Why can't we all just be as sharp as we were when we were 21? Well, a number of things often happen to us as we age. First of all, it's very common for a person to engage in less learning as we get older, right? When we're young, we're making new friends. Maybe we're moving to a new city. We're learning constantly. But as we hit middle age, that can slow down. We're pretty good at our jobs and we like being good. So we don't have as much to learn. Uh, so our brain's just not engaging in as much learning. 
Second of all, our brains undergo a certain amount of natural wear and tear, just like the rest of our bodies do. Connections between neurons get lost and neurons themselves can be lost due to the aging process. And finally, there are actually changes in how we sense the world. Information isn't coming in as clearly through the ears and the eyes. Our brains get less activation than they used to. So through the natural process of brain plasticity, your brain adapts to all these situations and rewires itself. But unfortunately, that rewiring isn't necessarily helpful. In these cases, mainly what it does is it makes the brain noisier. Brain information develops an internal source of noise. It's like a radio that's gone a bit off the signal. Everything coming into the brain gets some static added to it. Now, you remember from the beginning of this talk what the effect of external noise is, like when you try and hear and remember something in a noisy room, your memory's worse. Well, this internal brain noise works exactly the same way. It contributes to memory and thinking difficulties. So what can we do? What are things we can do to improve memory? I'm gonna wrap up my slides here and talk about three specific things that people can do, very different approaches. The first is focus, pay attention and add context. You know, here's an example of, here's an example of how to form a weak memory. You know, let's say you meet a person and she says, hey, my name is Mary. And you might say, oh, it's nice to meet you. But maybe you're distracted. You're thinking about a football game that's about to come on. And maybe you're checking your phone to see if there's something new on Facebook. This is gonna be a very weak memory. You might not remember Mary's name the next time you see her. Now let's make a strong memory, right? Here's again, my name is Mary. And you say back, it's nice to meet you, Mary. You know, echoing her name like that starts to reinforce it in your memory. And now build some associations. Where did you meet Mary? You know, maybe you met her in June when you were out at a picnic. What was she wearing? Oh, she's wearing a dress and it was hot out that day. Learn something about her. Oh, she's an accountant. She's friend with Susan. She plays bridge and then make the association. So does my other friend. Maybe I should get them together. All of these associations are going to strengthen that idea of who Mary is and what her name is. So when you go back looking for her name because of your attention, your focus and your rehearsal, you've built a strong memory. Here's a second approach. Now, this is pretty challenging, but it can be pretty interesting. And it's called a memory palace, which is just a wonderful word. Now, in this approach, which was actually originally developed in the classical days of ancient Greece and Rome, you develop a strong, detailed mental image of a certain place, perhaps your childhood home in this example. Next, in this place, you develop a very strong path of mental imagery that guides you through your memory palace. Now, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but you can see there's 52 numbers that this person has laid out in their memory palace. Here's the first one at the bottom of the stairs. Here's the next one halfway up the stairs. Then they go through the foyer and into the kitchen and up into the bedroom and up and up into the attic. Now, you have to establish this and through many days of practice, learn all of those locations. Then you can begin to use it. Now, this memory palace has 52 spots because the person who developed it used it for a pretty cool trick, memorizing an entire deck of shuffled cards in order. Now, if you've ever seen anyone do this, it's pretty amazing. And this is how it's done. The person looks at each card once and then using visual imagery puts that card in place. For example, if the first card is the seven of hearts, you imagine and remember the seven of hearts at spot one right there at the bottom of the stairs. And if the next card is the queen of diamonds, you imagine a queen of diamonds right there halfway up the stairs and so forth and so on. Now, this may sound hard, and it is hard, but with intensive practice, lots of people can actually learn how to do this. Now, unfortunately, it's a bit of a memory trick. It's not very useful in everyday situations. This is not how you're going to probably remember the name of someone you meet a bit better. If your spouse tells you to go to the store and pick up six things, you're probably not going to pull out your memory palace and do it. Um, but it is kind of a fun thing to try and learn how to do, and uh, you can amaze your friends at parties. But the last thing I'm going to talk about is, of course, Brain HQ. Now, Brain HQ is designed to enhance memory based on all of the science that I just told you about. The first thing that Brain HQ does is it's designed to rewire the brain. It's designed actually to improve the initial brain activation by the events that you might want to remember, essentially taking that noise out of the system so your brain records things stronger. And Brain HQ exercises are also designed to engage the neural centers that are specific to attention and reward and novelty detection, all of which uh, are crucial to forming memories. And as a result of that, in many, many clinical trials now, we've seen that uh, Brain HQ improves speed and attention, and most importantly, memory. And this even happens uh, and generalizes to real world behavior. Uh, in many studies, Brain HQ has been shown to improve real world memory skills as well as improving real world measures of brain health and brain resilience. And in fact, it's by rebuilding brain structures and improving them in all the ways we've talked about that Brain HQ delivers these incredible benefits. So I'll stop there with my advice about how to improve memory for a moment. And then Mike, 
uh, if I still have you, uh, I thought maybe we might talk a little bit about memory and, uh, and how to improve it. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> well, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, um, you know, I've talked a lot about kind of the basics of memory and, uh, and gone through it. And I'm sure I've uh, done some parts that are great and probably done a few things that you might want to expand on. But, um, but I thought I'd start here. You know, you are, uh, of course, a living legend in the field of neuroscience. You've been studying the brain and brain plasticity for many years now. You won the Kavli Prize. You got a gold medal handed to you by the King of Norway for your achievements in, uh, in neuroscience. So across that uh, incredible career, which is, of course, still going on as we speak, uh, I wonder if you might uh, kind of talk about, you know, what are the breakthroughs that you've seen in memory research? You know, what's happened and how did it change your thinking? Well, you talked about several of them. You know, the fact that you can actually see a witness, you can witness a memory in a sense being a, or the processes in, in, in action as the memory is being formed. That's a pretty amazing thing. It really also, is. You know, to me, the most single most amazing thing is that we now understand that the processes that control the fidelity of the representation of information, that is to say, to set it up for remembering, are plastic. So, you know, we know that people that struggle to remember, struggle to remember because they're, they're representing information in the brain, in their in information and thought or information they're receiving from the world in a poor way, in a degraded way, not degraded necessarily because it's coming in a degraded form, but degraded because the internal processes are so noisy. They're yeah. representing it with such lack of clarity, but it's all plastic. We can, we can actually change the performance characteristics of the brain by changing it. It can, it can be sharp again. Well, basically that, that's substantially what we're trying to do in, in, in a brain HQ like uh, setting, but also, you know, across this period of time, the same period of time, we have a deeper understanding of how the brain is actually controlling what I call the save it switch. You know, <laughs> so the brain only records information for the permanent record when it really matters to you. It's got to be on the ball and, and you know, and then as a function of its importance to you or, or emotional significance to you, it says save it. Now, in many individuals, it says save it right? <laughs> because they're machinery that controls these processes so weak. But actually, again, this machinery is plastic. If you engage it, if you use it, if you use it in the right way, you upregulate it, you make it more powerful, you make it more effective in recording information that really matters to you. So one of the things that you should be doing in life is you should be exercising your brains in ways that sustain it. And then finally, Henry, you know, one of the most important, one of the most exciting experiments that I read about, witnessed, I met the scientist, I know the scientist in Japan, who discovered the neurological basis of associative memory. And what they showed is that they could train an animal to, 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 to associate a small set of things. Uh, say, take a, some, I could write, say, maybe associate a picture of a turtle with a picture of, a, I don't let's say a baseball. It could be anything, right? Okay. And they trained the, monk, the, the monkey, they trained the, the rodent to make this distinction over and over and over again. And then they look in the brain to see if they can see any indication that that training has had an impact on its representation of the brain. Well, it's easy for them to find neurons that respond selectively to turtles or to respond selectively to baseballs. Okay. But what they find is importantly, is that the turtle in representation is directly and strongly connected to the representation of baseballs. Wow. And they find that if they present a picture of a turtle, let's say to the monkey or the rodent, that the brain responds appropriately as if they're seeing a turtle, but then in the next moment with no other presentation, it rolls to the area that represents selectively the baseball. Well, they show the animal a turtle, a baseball, and, and the activity first appears there, and then it rolls to the area of representation of baseball. Well, they that are, must be pretty much like learning someone's name, right? So if I'm at a party and I, and I meet a woman and you know, right. she says her name is Mary, what it sounds like is in my brain, when I see that image of her, that association right. is formed and it rolls on over to the name Mary. Right. Right. And then vice versa. When I hear the word Mary, that association is formed and my brain rolls on over to that image of her at the party. They're, 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 they're witnessing the stream of conscious association, the movement of thought. And, wow. and so they have, they're witnessing the, the impetus, the motor, the prediction that carries you forward in thought and organized thought. 
And obviously, it's really important that we keep this, this ability, this capacity in good shape all across the point of our life and continue to sustain it. Well, it seems like one of the other big changes that's really happened in our thinking about memory is, you know, in older days, it seems like psychologists and even neuroscientists had this idea that memory was kind of like a, a little box in your brain and you could put something into it. Like, I'm, I want to remember to get my medicine at the drugstore, or I want to remember that this person I met is named Mary. And there might be one box for memory and a different box for attention, a different box for hearing, and, you know, like a little line between each one. But it sounds like we now recognize that these systems are really much more deeply integrated with each other. Absolutely. No, absolutely. That's absolutely right. And and and, and also there are these one of the things that's been that's come from brain science is the elaboration of the understanding of these different classes of memory, of these different forms of remembrance, these different, for example, you talked a lot about declarative memory or about yeah. remember or narr- remembering a narrative about things and uh, you know, things that you can talk about from your historic past or that you can remember. But also there's a whole body of things that you you can't easily bring to mind. Right. They're powerfully in place, a whole giant pile of what we call implicit or non-declarative memories. So are those kinds of memories too? Like if I, if I learn to play the saxophone, would you call that a memory? Or, uh, or how about if I make friends with someone, right? Is, is that a kind of memory? You're generally not thinking about uh, playing that saxophone when you, when you, as, you, as, as the sound comes out, right? Because automatic. what you're doing is done, you, you could say beyond direct, direct conscious uh, thought substantially. Or you could say, I get on my bicycle. I haven't been on my bicycle for 10 years. <laughs> and I can, I, I, can, I can ride it pretty well because all of, those, all of that control of those actions, basically, I've recorded in a reliable way. And then I... I, uh, I hit a pebble. I hit a rock. I know, my body and my bicycle know I know exactly what to do to sustain my balance, to sustain my control. All of that from historic memory. I have an incredible reservoir of, of, of historically recorded abilities that I can call on. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems with this, Henry, is, is that as we get older in life, commonly, we spend so much of our time deploying operations in the brain. Right. That we, that we deploy automatically. Right. Out of our memory comes our ability to do all kinds of things. And it basically, and when we do that, we're kind of offline zombies. That's right. We're so good at things. We're just kind of on autopilot. We already know how to drive a car. We already know how to type on a keyboard. We already know how to call someone on the phone, right? Exactly. We're just in a rut. We're not engaging our brains in ways that are really advantaging them. We're users and not acquirers of ability. Yep. Yep. That's, uh, that's trained. That's absolutely right. So, um, so, you know, we have all those memories, you know, do they all just exist in isolation? Like if I have photos in a photo book, they might just all be sitting in the photo book in any order, but, but in the brain, is that how memories are stored or, or do they relate to each other in their storage? Well, you think of any common thing or any common experience you have. I mean, I don't take care of yourself to any common everyday uh, experience. Let's say I, I uh, open the door of my car Okay. And I and I uh, and I sit down in front of the instrument panel. And I say, I understand what all these things mean. Well, I think, well, well, where have I been in a car? You know, how many how many roads have I traveled? How many small towns have I gone through? How many times have I stopped at a motel or a gas station? How much of that can I remember? Mm-hmm. Who have I who have I had with me in a car? How many cars have I had? Right. I, if I look if I raise the hood, what's in the hood? How does it work? How does a carburetor all work? All those associations are kind of bound together. They're not I, individual memories. They all connect to each other and become stronger as a result. I, I could talk about car things or experiencing <laughs> cars or, or a place I've been in my car for hours. I could probably relate to a hundred thousand things that relate in some way or other from my brain. I could drag them out of some dark corner Mm -hmm. that relate in some sensible way to my car. Yeah. So, yep. I mean, so how does that work? As we get older, we might know more and more things, right? Like you mentioned, all these things you know about your car, they're all related to each other. But, you know, but it seems like our encoding of new memory starts to get worse. So, you know, is there a trade off here or can we somehow both know a lot of things from our long life and have a brain that's able to keep learning new things? Well, older people have the advantage of, of, of of a lifetime of acquired knowledge. But unfortunately, that tops out. And the average person, when they're about in this uh, middle of the seventh decade of life, so in the mid 60s, okay, and, that, and it flattens out. That is to say, they begin to lose as much as they gain. 
Gotcha. You know, remember, and then what happens beyond that point is that people slowly decline on the average. On the average, but not everyone, right? Well, no, you definitely want to be on the growth on the growth side. You want to continue <laughs> to grow in your knowledge and understanding. Of course, you want to continue to acquire. In fact, you want to do everything all across your life to accelerate your and amplify your ability to load your encyclopedic information base with all kinds of things because everything. You, you, you understand everything you know about the world comes from having a rich supply, a rich resource, a rich library right. to operate from in your operations and thought and an understanding. So we shouldn't be worried that we're filling our brain up with information and that's going to stop us from memory. We should be happy that we're filling our brain up with information because that gives more associations to bind things together and build a stronger memory. Is that right? Well, well, there are things that are, that you fill your brain you can, that can dominate you. It can be so powerful, right? That, that they can yep. be, they can be, yeah, they can drive you literally uh, in, into trouble, into the ditch. So we know that. And there also there's all kinds of useless information in the world that, that will, or you can say highly repetitive information that highly has repetitive, no, not useless, no great right? Value, no great value. But in general, information acquisition is a good thing. In general, it's a good thing. You never know what magic associative, uh, it's all the basis of invention and, and, intel, and adaptive intelligence. You, so you one can't. last question to wrap it up then. So what is the role of memory in our conscious experience, right? I think a lot of people feel like as they're thinking about themselves, they're thinking about their memories. How do those things relate? Well, when you, when you begin to lose your, yourself in, in, in older age, you begin to lose yourself because Basically, memory is required, your working memory is required to sustain the self, yourself in a very fundamental sense. I mean, you create the self by the reference of, of your actions and your thoughts, your feelings, what you hear, what you see, to their source. You do this on a massive scale, and all of this generates physical connection in your brain. This is me in action. This is me, the hearer. This is me, the right. seer. This so those memories me. really are you, right? They're your right. sense of yourself and everything you've experienced that creates the sense of who you, Mike, or me, Henry, is. And there are classical cases of people that have lost this ability of self-reference. You know, a, 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 a sort of a historic important example has been the study of schizophrenics. Because a schizophrenic can literally lose the identity of self. They can struggle to understand whether they just did something or, or you just did it or someone else, maybe God just did it. Uh, yep. they're, they're confused about, and, and this is not something that you want to have happen to you. You want to sustain yourself in a strong, salient, viable, active right. form. And of course, that's exactly what Brain HQ, which you and I and everyone at Posit Science have been working on, is how to build a brain that kind of sustains those strong, salient activations and storage of memories. That's the whole idea, Henry. <laughs> help well, everybody be a stronger person to the to the to the very end of their longer and healthy life all right well we can do that as the science has shown us uh so with that uh margie i think we have some questions i think we have a few that came in ahead of time and we're sure we're getting some that are coming in live as we speak do you want to take us to those i do although first to all of you attending guess what we have another question about Mike's weekend that you heard at the beginning <laughs> no. of the webinar. Um, so I'm just going to put one more poll up if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, and we'll see. So where were Mike's daughter, Karen, and her family, her husband, Ross, and the rest of her family actually on um, Father's Day? I'll send the poll now. You guys can... All right. We have some people who are very quick off the trigger and have a very good memory of Mike's children and their locations. <laughs> wow. I think we have some good Brain HQ users in this audience, Mike and Margie, because we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot of people who really manage to hear that story, process it through their working memory, put it into their hippocampus, and it is right now available for recall. So fantastic work. Fantastic right. work. That is right. So um, again, this is not meant to test you in any way, just kind of an illustration of how well memory um, persists over time. So I'm gonna end the poll right now and we'll see that 70% of people got it right. It was Virginia. <laughs> Good job. Good job to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and next Father's Day, make sure she stays here because that sounded like a pretty good pie. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we will move on to some questions. Um, so there's quite a few questions about 
uh, like from Wendy and from Arthur, how can diet affect memory? Are there dietary practices that support or deter memory? Uh, do you well, want to take that, Mike? Go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Well, well, uh, of course, uh, there there are a number of of, uh, of 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 strategies that should apply. I mean, that have been a number of things that have been demonstrated to be beneficial. Uh, most of the research is related to specific substances that relate to uh, health and, and brain function. And they, they impact memory in a general way, not in a specific way of, you could say, refining its operational characteristics, but in the way of e either amplifying your alertness or your brightness so it's easier for you to remember or, 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 or having some general impact like that, that, that is modulating your ability to record information that increase your sharpness. So for example, obviously, if you, uh, if you have a cup of coffee in the morning, you might be more alert. And if you're asked to set up in a memory test, uh, if you're, uh, uh, th there are a number of substances like this, uh, resveratrol, the, the uh, substance, the magic substance in wine or in, uh, or in chocolate or in uh, lots of other things in, uh, in uh, green, uh, some green vegetables and then uh, uh, I know you're looking out for yourself, Mike, because I know you're an avid gardener and I know that you enjoy a nice glass of red wine from time to time. I do. I absolutely, I absolutely and, uh, do. You know, as you know, one thing that brings that together is this beautiful work done by Martha Clara Morris at Rush University, where she's been talking about the mind diet, the M-I-N-D diet. Where she kind of sews together some of the ideas of a healthy diet for your heart. And then by adding a bit more around leafy green vegetables and by adding uh, uh, things around berries and particularly blueberries, she's constructed a diet that seems to be associated with helping people keep better cognitive function for longer, probably just by keeping the brain healthier as an organ. And they don't forget the cold water fish because fish oil <laughs> is, is a well demonstrated, has well demonstrated general health benefits for your brain. Absolutely. Not just for memory, but in general, it's a good thing to have a piece of fish every so often. Well, uh, I became a pescatarian. I eat uh, mostly fish now about a year ago, partly for my heart and partly because I had read enough of those scientific papers to decide it was good for my brain as well. There's another interesting study that's been done or a series of studies that done with a, with, a, with a supplement called creatine. And what's interesting about it is because it's something that is, a, is a, you know, you could say it is a booster of your alertness, of your brightness. Uh, but we normally get it from eating fish and, and meat. And, but for a vegetarian or, or, or for a vegan, of course, you, they, they're short of it. So creatine supplementation can be really a positive thing for such an individual. So they might think about that. All right. Are we ready for another question? Yeah. Uh, a couple of people have asked, is there a relationship between memory and intelligence? Oh, well, Mike, well, we're going to have to say what intelligence is to start with, aren't we? Well, intelligence is, is, is related to uh, uh, speed of operations in the brain. It's really related to organic brain health. And of course, uh, an organically healthy brain by, by is going to be a brain that is a high, high resolver that's representing information with high accuracy at high speed. And so there's obviously a direct relationship between the ability to do that and the ability to record information into the permanent record with high accuracy. So absolutely, smarter people have better memories. But the other side of it also is, is that your ability to operate in, in, on the inventive side of life, your ability to operate to, 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 to be adaptively intelligent is dependent upon the information you've recorded in your brain. So, so you've got to have good information stores. That's where all of those new clever combinations of information come by, come, come from to generate the important new idea. So, yeah, so, and, uh, and here we might also kind of tease apart some of these different facets of memory because the kind of memory that we're usually thinking about related to intelligence is working memory because to solve problems in creative ways, you have to be able to juggle a number of things in your mind. But I think it's fair to say that there are lots of very intelligent people who nonetheless, um, you know, occasionally have tip of the tongue syndrome, occasionally show up at that grocery store and they can't remember quite what was on the list. So it's not as not as clear that you have to have very strong, let's say, uh, declarative memory or put another way. We've all seen an absent minded professor, right? Genius in their field. I've, I've seen at least one, I think. And uh, <laughs> genius in their field. But, you know, occasionally. Um, uh, you know, maybe doesn't remember everything else, but why is that? Why could someone be so intelligent, uh, but maybe not have the focus or that other kind of memory to remember everything in their life? 
Well, you can have a you can have an enormous amount of information at hand, and and you can call on it under the right circumstances. But on the other hand, you can be down, you can be down in your you know there can be a depressed person that has capacity to, for great achievement if they could just turn up the lights again. Right. There are just all kinds of reasons why you know in this complex process the process of the brain why a person can have great ability and yet be be turned on to low you know, have the have the have their lights turned down low. That's all right. of this plastic, Henry. All of this and, uh, can be reinvigorated and revitalized in almost any individual. And maybe have their lights just pointed in certain directions. I think we've all seen very intelligent people. And one of the things that gives them that strong working memory and that strong intelligence is they're just very focused on certain classes of problems. Right. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to remember a name when they meet someone at a party because they're just focused on a different set of things. And there they have all of the strong associations and all of the, all of the, all of the relationships that basically continues to reinforce their ability to make beautiful concepts constructs in this domain that's so beautifully exercised and recorded. Yep. All right, Margie, what do we have next? Yeah. So uh, given that we're talking so much about memory and how memory is so important, um, Carrie asks, yet Brain HQ seems to limit the time we spend on memory exercises, kind of moving around the categories. Is that true? Is her perception true? And why do we do that? Well, you can practice remembering forever. And, uh, and the brain, but the brain hasn't forgotten how to remember. The reason the brain struggles in remembering is because, uh, is because it's representing information in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't support reliable recording of information. And that takes a brain HQ like form of exercise. Now there are a variety of things you could do in your natural everyday life that could contribute to that. But Brain HQ is, is, it represents a strategy in which that we attempt to achieve that with high efficiency. So over a relatively narrow period of time, you can actually very substantially sharpen the information represented in your brain as you're listening, as you're, as you're looking, as you're thinking. And that's what we're trying to achieve in your brain substantially by the way uh, these exercises uh, are designed. And there's no, no substitute for that, really. That's exactly right. And of course, these exercises are designed to work together. If you were just doing a quote memory exercise, but let's say your brain was very slow because you hadn't done a speed exercise, or let's say your attention was not very focused because you hadn't done any attention exercises, then you might be exercising those memory uh, sort of you know aspects, but information is not getting in fast enough. You're not recording it carefully with attention. And so your memory is not improved. And in that sense, memory has to be done you know, after we've spent up the brain and after we've sharpened attention, right? And, and also, Henry, necessarily, you know, a person might not realize it, but every brain HQ exercise has a strong working memory component. We're actually trying to directly improve in everything we do, yeah. working memory, because it's right at the heart of generating a stronger you. And that's something that we're trying to achieve. We're trying to have a person that's more connected, more vital, more alive in their, in their elemental personhood by training their brain. It's a great question though. And we're happy to see people thoughtfully using Brain HQ. What else have we got, Margie? Well, I think this is kind of an interesting question from Jane. How do you think all these memory tools that we have now, things like reminders on our phone, Alexa, remind me to do this. How is that affecting our brain's ability to remember? Well, I think that they're, uh, they're sort of a, a re reasonable delaying action. And, uh, and, uh, Delaying actions sometimes uh, make or uh, help you get through the day and get through life a little better. I mean, we all should apply memory tricks on some level. Of course, we all do apply them, but they don't re relate to the fundamental problem, the fundamental issues that are in play that are commonly holding us back in our ability to remember or that account for our decline in memory or, 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 or relate to improving our abilities in remembering. So you need to address these issues in a more fundamental way. And uh, basically just putting off the uh, accepting decline by, uh, by, in a sense, finding strategies to make up for them by, by doing things like uh, writing things down on a list or, uh, or carrying the reminder around in your pocket is, uh, is a cheesy way to try to keep yourself in an in a organically healthy brain state. Yeah, I guess the one way I think about it, Mike, is, you know, these are things that help us get about the complexity of modern life better, 
But in doing so, we're probably not engaging our brains in the way that we used to, to keep them healthier. It's kind of like having a car, right? It's great to have a car, right? You can drive and see your friends, you can get to work, you can go shopping. But as a result of that, you probably walk a lot less than you used to. And so your physical health is not as strong as it was before you had a car, even though some aspects of your life are better with the car. Now, we would never throw our cars out, right? You know, we like to get around and do these things. And, you know, these memory aids strike me as the same way, right? We have a lot to do in our days. It's good to have calendar appointments, good to have Alexa, but it does mean that we now need to think a bit more proactively about our brain health because our brain health is not being as supported as strongly by our everyday life as it used to be. And that's why things like eating right with the mind diet and using brain HQ become more important because we have to actively take care of our brain health. We live in a world in which we look up the answers to almost everything. Yes. You know, historically, uh, we had to reason to them. We had to try to we had had to try to mine our our memories to try to understand what the answer was, right. and we we lose all that practice. We give up all that practice. So yep. don't give up all that practice. I I beg of you, don't Just keep keep practicing using your brain, uh, mining your, and searching your memory. Basically, continue to reason to things. Don't look up the answer to every damn thing in your life. And. Uh, <laughs> Not that I'm, not, not that I'm, we all will, we all will, <laughs> but think about how to take certain times to really work on your brain health as well. Exactly. Okay, we probably have time for a couple more questions, I think. Uh, sure. Um, one is, why is smell such a strong memory? Oh, this is really an interesting one from a brain science perspective. Mike, do you want to feel it? Why do odors drive yeah, such and, strong and, memories and, in our mind? And interestingly, people have conducted experiments in which they, which you can imagine a smell and they can actually see the brain light up. You can actually imagine a taste or a smell and you can actually see activity generated in your brain. That's specific to that taste or smell. I think that's pretty wonderful. But but it's just, a, it's powerfully associated with uh, something that's really important to our brain. And that's called reward. You know, because in a sense, one of the things we work for in life is food. We <laughs> things that sustain us. And, and, and so we associate aroma so much with reward, not just on the, on the food side, but also in a sense, we associate re, re, aroma with all kinds of other things that relate to, you know, our, uh, our mating, our, our uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, our, our loving, our lots of other things. Right. And, and uh, you know, Mike, my understanding is one of the things that's really interesting about smell is it's argued that it's our, our most primitive sense, right? And in that sense, every other sense comes through a part of the brain called the thalamus where that sense could be shut off if it needs to. But smell actually has direct access to some of the memory centers in the brain. We almost can't turn it off even if we wanted to. Uh, it's linked to so many things that are emotionally important to us, things we love, Things we things that we see a be with beauty, yep. you know, things we see that are that are satisfying and so forth. So, it is so strongly emotionally loaded so often, and that that contributes to its memory. We have just a minute left. Um, should we try for one more question? Yeah, why don't we do one more question and then we can wrap up? Thank you. All right. This is uh, Judy asks. So, what can we do to practice memory when we're not in front of our computer to do Brain HQ? Like. Do driving, taking a walk? How can we exercise our memory just in a daily way? What a great question. Well, there, you want to start with this, Henry? Well, uh, well, yeah, I'll take a quick swing at it at first, which is, um, you know, anything that you're doing, you can turn into more like exercising your memory by some of the things we talked about today. So think about really focusing, right? So when you're outside on your walk, you know, see what's new in your neighborhood. Uh, try and um, uh, and focus on maybe there's a new bed of flowers. Maybe a neighborhood has painted the uh, neighbor has painted their house. And by bringing that attention and that novelty detection, you're going to let more information flow into your brain and um, and become uh, you know activate those memory senses more strongly. So as, as Mike sometimes put it, you know, don't wander through life as a zombie just looking at your phone. Make sure you're fully engaged, and that unto itself is going to strengthen your brain and your memory. But Mike, how do you uh, how do you want to expand or build on that? Uh, you may, you may make a great point when you exercise. Basically, make give, make make sure the exercise has value to your brain and your brain in, in reconstructing the control of your actions and the control of your your, your movements. And when you exercise out there in, out there in the world, if that's where you're if that's where you're engaging, uh, do pay attention. Reconstruct it in your brain. You are very directly and powerfully engaging your hippocampus. And your hippocampus basically is designed to, to lay information on the platform of time and place. 
So any activity that's elaborated in your life it, that has a dimension of time and place in it, on it, with it, basically, that's a very good kind of exercise to master. None better than simply becoming a master of the world you live in, in your memory, in fact. And then you can use that as an opportunity to rehearse and practice. So if you've been out in the world, doesn't matter what you're doing, like the, like the listener said, on a drive or out for a walk, tell someone about it afterwards. Tell them what the high points were, what was interesting that you saw. Use that as an opportunity to both practice your own memory and then rehearse it so that when you sleep that night, it'll get a bit more burned into your brain. And for God's sake, get good sleep if you don't. <laughs> not sleeping in a, in a, you know. Work hard in trying to improve your sleep habits and your, and, your, and your sleeping experiences, because that's really important for sustaining memory. All right. Well, with okay. that note of giving everyone a good night's sleep, uh, maybe we should wrap up then, Margie. Yeah. I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining this webinar. This was actually our second webinar in our series called the Brain HQ Academy series. The first one was on music and the brain, and we'll be having one in another one in a couple of months on a new topic. So just keep um, tuned for that. Um, one other thing is that obviously there's still 88 or so unanswered questions here. They're all really good questions. Uh, please feel free to email us your question at support at brainhq.com. We, uh, you know, it's hard for us to get to all of them. It takes some work to answer all these hard scientific questions, but we will do our best to get to the ones, especially the ones that are asked most often and make sure to get to back to as many people as we can. But please understand if we take a while or if we don't quite get to all of them. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, you know, why don't you today pick up Brain HQ again and work on improving your brain just in the ways that Mike and Henry talked about today? And uh, that's it. What about you guys? All right. Well, thanks to everyone for coming. I think one of the real thrills about working at Brain HQ is we have so many incredibly smart, engaged, thoughtful people who come and join us in these webinars and ask great questions and give Mike and Margie and I a wonderful excuse to talk about the thing that we love the most, which is the brain. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, happy brain training. It was great to be with you guys, <laughs> wherever you are. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.